In the last video, I made an offhand remark that network theory could be used to study the Pokemon type advantage network. I mainly just meant for this as a funny example of something one could do, but probably never would. As I thought about it some more, I realized there is actually tangible and pedagogical reasons for applying math to something as silly as Pokemon. You see, in my opinion, math is boring and uncreative only insofar as its application is boring and uncreative. I'm not basing this off nothing, however. In high school, I was an art student failing both math and physics. That's a topic for another day, but it does form the basis of my belief that nobody is hopelessly bad at math, only bored by it. So, I figured, why not? Let's look at how someone would actually apply network theory, and let's use Pokemon as the example. If you want, you can think of it as a tutorial, I've even linked the Python code I used for this analysis in the description so that anyone can play with it, but let me make it explicitly clear. The point here is not to look at Pokemon, and more generally not even to look at network theory, but rather look at an example of applying real-world mathematics in a way so as to hopefully attract an audience that would otherwise completely disregard math. In the description, I've also included citations to a network analysis of the Star Wars social network and social network analysis of K-pop fandoms. It's my hope that you can take what you learn from these resources and then go on to think about how networks could be applied to the things that you enjoy. So with that, I think we're finally ready to get started. Pokemon themselves are a set of, at the time of writing, approximately 900 creatures. Within the series of TV shows and video games, uh, small children will perform the morally questionable act of catching these creatures and making them fight against one another. But apparently they like it, so I don't know. These creatures have associated elements, or types, water, fire, electric, and so on, of which there are 18 in total. Some of these types are strong against others, so we can think of Pokemon as a complex game of rock, paper, scissors. Together, these 18 elements comprise the nodes of the type advantage network, where I've indicated the direction of the advantage by the arrow and the color. So, for example, water is strong against fire, and so there's a blue arrow pointing towards fire. How these elements triumph over one another is exactly the type of problem network theory could be used to analyze. For completeness sake, I should mention that the concept of direction wasn't something that was explicitly discussed in the previous video, but hopefully makes intuitive sense. Such networks are called directed networks, which stand in contrast to undirected networks representing two-way relationships. For example, while atomic bonds are undirected, voltage spikes of neurons typically travel in a single direction, suggesting a directed network. I'll also point out that the Pokemon network has self-loops, meaning that some types are strong against themselves. I do want to emphasize here that this is a very naive analysis. A more detailed approach would either take into account the fact that Pokemon may actually possess up to two types at a time, which would require 171 nodes, or, much more ambitiously, we could use all 900 Pokemon as the network nodes. However, in both cases, it's only the building of the network itself that would be more difficult. So, while the results of today's analysis most certainly will not resemble how Pokemon is actually played, the tools we will use will work just the same in the more realistic cases. In fact, the 171 node case is not even too difficult as advantages just add together. So, if anyone wants to take the code I made and expand it, feel free to do so and let me know what you find. Once we have a network, the very first thing a network scientist would study is the distribution of links amongst the nodes. For the moment, let's focus on the fighting element. The number of links incident on a node is called its degree, so we would say that this element has a degree of 8. However, we probably want to distinguish between a link pointing in versus a link pointing out. Somewhat unimaginatively, we'll call these the in and out degrees respectively. In this case, the fighting type has an in degree of 3, meaning 3 types are strong against it, and an out degree of 5, meaning fighting is strong against 5 types. It's worth noting here that a player can only have at most 6 Pokemon at a time, and while they can switch between these 6 in battle, they can't switch the roster itself. So, in our naive analysis, one approach would be to pick a team composed of the 6 types with the largest out degrees. For the first 5 this is easy. Ground, Fighting, Fire, Ice, and Rock have the highest number of advantages in that order. 
The final position has a six-way tie, though I think it makes sense to choose water, as this has the smallest number of weaknesses amongst the possible types, or in other words, the smallest in degree. For much larger networks, one would also be interested in averages of these degrees. So the average non-directed degree, which is often indicated by these angle brackets with a K, is just the sum of all degrees divided by the number of elements. Likewise, we can do the same for the in and out degrees, and if you do, you'll notice that they're the same. This isn't just a coincidence though, and will always be true. And I encourage you to think about why, intuitively speaking, this should be the case. In other words, why, on average, the number of in arrows would be equal to the number of out arrows. As we move on in our tour of networks, we reach the next topic, which is the concept of connectedness. Stated in the form of a question, Network Connectedness asks, Can I, from any arbitrary node in the network, get to any other node in the network? This is, as you can imagine, a very important question in real-life networks, such as the analysis of power grids or the internet. Here, we can immediately see that the type advantage network is undoubtedly not fully connected. If we start at the normal type, then we're stuck, as the normal type doesn't lead to anything else. In fact, because both normal and dragon type serve as dead ends, every path, regardless of where it started, would always exclude at least one element. That being said, if we ignore the directions, then this network would be connected. This is still an important feature to have, as the node can still feel the influence of the rest of the network. So, a network scientist would call this weakly connected. This is in contrast to a strongly connected network where every node could reach every other node along a directed path. If, on the other hand, we removed a link so that an element was on its own, we would say that the network was disconnected. In the real world though, most networks are neither fully connected nor fully disconnected, and so a more fuzzy notion of connectedness needs to be utilized, but the intuition is still the same. Both network connectedness and degree distribution are in some way related to the structure of a network. This makes sense, as ultimately, understanding structure is the entire goal of network analysis. There are many, many ways to study the structure of networks, of course. So, because of the sheer number of techniques, I want to focus on one in particular, especially because it has a close connection to the Pokémon games. Triangles are very important aspects of networks and are often the focus of network analysis as they represent robustness. Take for example a network of computers. A triangle ensures that even if one path breaks, there's still internet access to the rest of the network. But triangles also have a very important place in the Pokémon games. At the start of each game, going back to the very first, the player is asked to choose their very first creature from one of three. In each game since 1996, these three have had the types of water, fire, and grass, which form a triangle in the type advantage network. Following your choice, your rival chooses the type that is advantageous against yours, serving to establish a sense of triumph against all the odds when you beat them in battle. Wow, am I a video game critique YouTuber now? Anyway, the question is, is water, fire, and grass the only such triangle? Well, no. Using network analysis, we can find that any of these 15 could serve the same purpose. I do wonder if Nintendo is aware of this. I, for one, would like to see a water, ground, lightning trio. One last note regarding structure. We can define a cycle in a network as a path that takes you back to the starting point after a given number of moves. So a triangle is a cycle of length 3, whereas a loop is a cycle of length 1. Interestingly, the type advantage network has no cycles of length 2, meaning no pairs of types are both strong against each other. And while I don't have much more to say about that, I do wonder why it is from a game design point of view. If anyone happens to have an idea why, I'd love to know. The last network analysis tool I want to look at is Centrality, which attempts to rank nodes according to some notion of importance. As you can imagine though, that's rather abstract and depends on real-world context. Because of this, a single node may be classified as important or unimportant depending on the problem at hand, and the centrality measure which best reflects that context. Let's take a step away from the Pokémon network for a second to consider a more intuitive example. In the previous video, we talked about hubs, which are nodes that have particularly high degrees. If this network represented something like an airport system, then we would probably surmise that these hubs are particularly important because of their high degrees. The centrality measure that would probably best encapsulate this would be degree centrality, 
which ranks nodes according to the number of links that they have. This is exactly what we use when composing our team of six based off the highest out degree values. But what about this node in the middle? Sure, the number of links it has is very low, but it connects the hubs and in large part dictates how the network flows. This seems like a pretty important thing you'd want to consider, but it's not reflected in the degree centrality at all. This is because degree centrality does not capture the context in which this node is deemed important. Instead, you'd have to use a different centrality measure to identify it, namely the betweenness centrality, which measures how much a node, uh, well, stands between other nodes. There are many other centrality measures, of course, though I won't go through them here. Intuitively speaking, it's the same concept, just reflecting different contexts. Of course, the example I gave was pretty easy because I drew the network in such a way that emphasizes those particular features. So let's go back to the Pokemon network. Can you, just by looking at it, tell which node has the highest between a centrality? Probably not. Leave your guess in the comment section below, it boosts engagement. Just kidding, of course, it's this one, which is, in a low-key kind of way, the entire point here. Network theoretic tools like centrality measures, the different algorithms for structure analysis, and everything else we looked at today allow us to find which are the important nodes without having to rely on how we've drawn the network. And while in the context of Pokemon this doesn't really mean anything, in the context of something like a power grid network or the internet or the brain, finding which nodes have high betweenness or high degrees or any other centrality measure is extremely important, as it lets us focus our resources on those nodes in particular. And that's it. So how good is network theory actually? Well, as Pokemon has evolved from its initial inception in 1996, the use of network theory to analyze Pokemon has gotten more complex, but only in the initial building of the network. The tools and techniques of network theory are robust and can provide mathematical insight in places where one would not expect. And again, let me re-emphasize that was the entire point here. While the goal of applied mathematics and physics is to solve extremely important real-world problems, we shouldn't think that it's limited to that, or that it's above being applied to something as silly as Pokemon. Math can be, and let me tell you is, as creative as art. And I think we really need to start leveraging that aspect. Thanks for watching.